Hi, this is Kimberly. This is a synopsis and a critique of Chapter 27 of the book Letters from Christopher, Tragic Confessions of the Watts Family Murders. This book is by Cheryl and Cadle, and the chapter is titled Christopher's True and Final Confession and His Testimony. Okay, so let's just start with the title of the chapter, True and Final. True and Final? So how do we know this is a factual and accurate account, Chris Watts? You, Chris Watts, by your own admission, are a damn liar pants. You have given us a total of five versions of the truth. This is Chris's truth. August 13th, 2018, Chris said, Shanann and the girls went to a friend's house. August 15th, 2018, before the arrest, Chris said, Shanann killed the girls, so I did the same thing to her. November 6, 2018, guilty plea. Chris said, I did all of the murders, so I'm pleading guilty and I don't want to talk about it. February 18, 2019, Wisconsin. I killed Shanann after we were intimate. The four of us rode in my work truck to Survey 319, and that's where I ended the lives of my daughters. But this one, this one is the true truth. April 23, 2019, Chris's pen pal scribble is writing a book. A bond quickly formed, and now they go by Chris Sibble, joining their names together. After Shanann passed, the girls woke back up. We all rode in my company truck to my work site, and I did the unspeakable. And final. I don't know if you should go so bold as to say final. I understand you have amnesia due to the trauma you endured. Perhaps a trip to the next door infirmary is in order, as you appear to be, to use your word, Chris, the epitome of PTSD, passive, trembling, stupid dumbass. So that was just my dealing with the title. Once I read the first paragraph, I realized Nimrod actually considered taking my advice. He actually tossed around in that peanut head an exorcism. Yeah, he thought about asking for a Catholic priest, but there was no need because the demon exercised itself right there in his jail cell. Of course, there were no witnesses to this. But before I get to that part, the first sentence was, quote, he felt so alone, end quote. Of course he's alone. He did that shit to himself. He questioned himself why he would do such a thing. Scribble says, quote, what was in him that he could allow this to take his life from him by taking their lives, end quote. He knew had there been any doubt it was a dark spirit he was dealing with. He for sure found out on August 15th that it had to be something dark because he came face to face with it, end quote. I'm sure something dark did come to confront you. You had just lied on Shanann. Well, Chris had never believed in anything like that before, so he was certain that no one else would believe him either. Well, you have just spent the last 12 hours or so talking out of your ass and making intentional false statements. Who the fuck is going to believe your crazy ass? Quote, the night the dark spirit left him, he believed there were two of them, end quote. Is it just me, or does this not make sense? I don't even want to explain how it doesn't make sense because it doesn't warrant that much attention. But on the night the dark spirit left him, he had a confrontation with them, the dark spirit, but two of them. Reputedly, they materialized and took on the form of his maternal grandparents. My mind immediately goes to picturing a hologram. So, spirits are non-physical, so how do we know they are dark? Oh yes, they came into being as Grandma Gramps. I mean, Cindy Watts' parents, his maternal grandparents, they were dark, shadowy figures with blood crimson eyes. So Chris was all like, what up? But he kind of needed to square up to them because this wasn't a social call. This will be explored more in depth later as we get to the letters. Yes, we are going to get to the letters finally. But Scribble says, quote, Some things in this book may seem repetitive because of the order in which Christopher told during the research, end quote. Well, as a book writer, you put that shit in order, over and over and over, until it flows well and you are enraged and infuriated and fucking tired of looking at it. Scribble says, quote, Following are the main letters he wrote. I did not post all of the letters, but some of the main letters, end quote. This is horseshit, Scribbles. 
We want all the damn letters. The name of the book is Letters from Christopher, not I Copy Discovery, damn it. If you needed page filler, this is where you could have used the fucking page filler. Don't decide for us what are the highest in importance letters. Good God Almighty, Glenda, you wouldn't know noteworthy if it bit you on the ass. Quote, there are things in the letters that can shock people, end quote. Yes, please. That's what we're here for. Bring it on, Lois Lane. Scribble says this book, quote, is his way of putting all the missing pieces of the puzzle together, end quote. My response to that is we can only put a half-assed puzzle together because you held back on some of the flipping pieces. For God's sake, this is an intricate puzzle, missing several complex pieces, and no picture on the blasted box. This is a disastrously mishandled undertaking. Oh, never mind. Let's call it what it is. This is a clusterfuck. Fiddle dee dee, look at me. I'm griping and bitching again. And I know it's not ladylike to be so condemnatory. But I like it. It's fun for me. I find it amusing. But if you were put off by it, then you know what? Fuck off. But CW says there's nothing left to tell after this. Does this mean no more books or interviews? Ever? We have to get word to him that not all of the letters he wrote to her were shared. So yes, there is more to tell. I wonder if he has read the book. If so, is he satisfied with the end result? She really needed to hire someone to give guidance on writing this book. I'm fairly confident this was a one-shot opportunity, and I feel like she blew it big time. He wants forgiveness for what he's done, and he knows it's a tall order, but it's all he can ask for. I imagine we are getting to that part of the book that Scribble promised to CW. It was something along the lines of, Chris Sable were united or in agreement that Chris and shit would have a chapter to blather on about. I mean, give his testimony of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Before I begin, if any of you feel moved in such a way, please... You are welcome to join hands among yourselves and bow your heads. I am all about protocol and etiquette and shit. The first letter is to the Rusiks. He didn't mail this to them, but instead is using the book as a platform. I disapprove. This should have been sent privately, maybe to their lawyer, if he was worried about stepping on toes. Quote, These letters contain the things that Christopher did not share with the FBI or even his family. This is the platform in which Christopher was the most comfortable to tell all the only way he would tell all, end quote. Is it just me, or should Cato have gone to the FBI or CBI? Since he had new information to share on this case, I'm pretty sure this would have been the flip and proper thing to do. Scribble then gives us an oxymoronic disclaimer about how the letters may contain grammatical errors and typos. Oh dear me. But he writes an open letter to Mr. and Mrs. Rusick and Frankie Jr., stating he is sure they hate him and he would be surprised if they didn't. Quote, this is a moment in my life that I will never be able to undo and it rips me apart every single day. End quote. Moment. A moment is an indefinitely short period of time. This is more than a moment, you dipshit. For weeks on end, he was carrying on a raunchy affair made plans and executed the poisoning of his pregnant wife with the intention of having her miscarry. The hours of carrying out the murders and disposing of their bodies, the days of outrageous lies, every single time he opened that repulsive mouth. Not a moment, dude. Again, I feel like he's trying to distance himself. It was a moment. I wasn't myself. I was taken over by dark forces. If I hadn't met Nikki, if Shanann hadn't gone to North Carolina for six weeks. Oops, I got away from the letter. But Nimrod tells the Rusiks, spelled incorrectly, that he still considers them as in-laws. He asks that they can find forgiveness for him one day, and asks if they have compassion for his family and consider reconciling and maintaining a relationship with them. He prays they forgive and heal talk and share, and visit the grave sites together. I'm certain they will give serious consideration to your suggestions. Then a letter to Sherilyn on April 4th, 2019. Even though Chris is still on protective confinement, he is in a cell for 23 hours per day, 
but he's fine with it because God is in there with him. God has opened his eyes to some things Chris and shit has been holding in his heart and not acknowledging to himself. He has a heart. Has this been proven? Chris and shit. This is Chris and chicken shit formed into a new word. If we all start using it together, I'm convinced it will be placed in the dictionary. Chris and shit says he has never had a psychological exam. He says if it had been done during his case, as he calls it, that it could have been subpoenaed by the quarter DA. Apparently, Scribble suggested Asperger's symptoms to him, and he says it makes a lot of sense. Does he even have cognitive and emotional functioning? He just comes across to me as vacant, uninhabited, desolate. Anyone that wants to get in there and scrounge around, well, good luck and Godspeed. Chris and Chip wants to know if his diet is really that exciting as apparently something was in the media about it. I've not heard about that. Something about what he eats in a day. Last chapter, Chris and Shit mentioned the handbook that he received. I found it online, and I'll link it in the description of the video. It's quite a riveting read. He brings up the house cell, saying it has been pushed back, not because of an ongoing investigation, but because the cell price will barely bring what is owed. He mentioned that he will be able to get a TV and a radio soon. Oh, wasn't that nice? I'd hate for him to be bored. She apparently asked about CDs, and he said those are not allowed because they can be broken with sharp edges and used as a weapon. For that reason, they are classified as contraband. And why the hell didn't she include her letters to him? Instead of trying to figure out what the hell he's responding to. Never mind. And that Scribble has been added to the visitors list, and he was eager to meet her. And I am just going to read this part. I'm sure it will make more sense to those of you that are not a heathen like me. Chris and Shit said to Scribbles in the letter, quote, I like your question, what does it mean to die out to Christ daily? To me, it means to look at his character and model yourself as he was when he walked the earth, end quote. And then Chris and Shit went on to quote inspiring scripture, and I don't mean to be rude, but that's when my mind tends to start wandering. But Chris and Shit hopes we can all look at our own lives and receive the Lord into our hearts. He says, quote, I believe if roles were reversed, and I had read a book about this happening to someone, I would have come to the Lord. It would have hit home and shown me what was important in life, end quote. Confound it, Chris and Shit, because I recollect that your wife sent you a book to read. You didn't even crack it open. The investigators found it in the trash. Officer Wally said, quote, I collected a hardback book within its original Amazon shipping box that was entitled Hold Me Tight, appearing to be brand new. I was informed that it had been located in the recycle bin, end quote. Under what circumstances would you have been inclined to read such a book? Oh, I know. Being placed in an empty room with nothing else but the book, like when you were placed in the jail cell with the Bible. Perhaps Shanann should have confined you to Dieter's dog crate with the book, but that would have been controlling and bossy of her. But what other way to get you to read a fucking book that potentially could have unsnarled your snake in the grass self out? So shut up. You wouldn't have read a fucking book that could have changed all this. Quit making excuses and, and just, just shut up. Another letter to Scribble not dated. Dates would have been nice. And just because Fuckface didn't date it didn't mean that Scribbles couldn't have dated it for the book. He tells about when he was booked into Weld County Jail. He was placed in the suicide watch pod wearing a turtle suit and laid down on his bunk in the darkness. What happened about the paper gown and laying on the floor on a thin pad as described in chapter 26? So what the hell is this horseshit? This people, this is why it takes me so long to get the next video out. Because this gibberish is a befuddled mess and I constantly have to cross-reference the contradictory nonsense. Stop with the fucking lies and embellishing. I keep thinking I fucked up somewhere and misinterpreted some shit and told y'all the wrong bloody bits and bobs in earlier videos and then I'm dreading making a retraction statement and all of that 
But no, I didn't fuck up. Like Janan said, I am strong, I am smart, I am confident, and damn it, I am right too. And one of them is lying, but I can't tell which one, because this book is poorly written. There, I've said it. I know I've been hiding my true feelings, and I have been trying to be all gracious and elegant and shit, but I just can't with this book. Chris and shit lay down on his bunk in the darkness, with just a tiny light in the distance for the guards and wondered if this was his new normal. Soon he started seeing the dark male and female figures that seemed to be his grandparents, but they are the dark spirits that have been referenced earlier in the book. They are wearing vintage clothing, and he identified them as his grandparents from his mother's side. He says he recognized that they were a demon that came from inside him. Their eyes were blood red. I don't get how a demon inside of you is your grandparents. What is the relevance of that, and isn't it kind of insulting? Maybe they came to whip the tar out of him. He most definitely needed a violent and prolonged physical attack, of which only a grandparent can give. Grandma used to make us go pick a switch from the tree. If it was a little wimpy one that we brought back, she would go get one herself, the length of which could rival a tree branch. But it was long and thin, and she could get that wild swinging action going on. And when everyone saw the red telltale welts on your legs, they knew you'd been up to no good. That's back when anyone could hit kids. You could be at a friend's house, and if their parents were in a bad mood, everyone over that day would get a beating. And then don't tell your parents about it, because then you would get another one right there at the kitchen table during dinner or in the front yard so all of your friends would see. That's when kids would actually spend all day outside. In fact, we were told to not come home except to eat dinner, take a bath, and go to bed. I think it was the law back then. But you must understand, Chris Watts grew up when they stopped doing all of that. Kids were pampered, reasoned with, and allowed to freely express themselves. That's bullshit. No wonder he's a candy ass was chicken shit. Anyway, the visit from his grandparents freaked him out. After a week, he was moved to the hole, where other inmates screamed mean shit to him and hurt his feelings. Things such as, I'm going to rip your face off, or kill yourself, to I'm going to F your wife in the afterlife. Chris and shit said, all of these comments felt like daggers hitting my heart. Well, given what you had done, I would say those remarks were in character with being in the hole and being with like-minded people. He came to the conclusion that this must be what hell is like. Well, Chris and shit, any new situation is strange or unusual in the beginning, but you'll get used to evil and punitive suffering and the eternal punishment of your own personal hell. During this time is when he started reading the Bible. He didn't think God could forgive what he had done, but he was looking for a way to hang in there as he listened to the ways described to him in painful detail of which he should kill himself, or to just let one of the persons who comprised his new social group do it for him. He finished the Bible in about two weeks. It was hard to concentrate at times due to the noise and some of the mean letters he got. Some of the letters were encouraging and gave him Bible verses that he should commit to memory. Hey, I have a couple for you, Chris and shit. Quote, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Or, he who loves his wife loves himself. His attorney team visited him about three to four times a week. He claims they were his only human contact and treated him with compassion. He says they flew in his mom, dad, and sister on November 5th, the day before he pled guilty. He got to spend 30 minutes with each of them individually. Chris and Chet says, quote, How does a person look their mother in the eyes, who is hurting more than can be imagined, and tell them that you are guilty of, of killing their precious granddaughters, but offer no explanation as to the reasons why? End quote. After meeting with his family, he was moved to another pod called Close Watch. He says, quote, This was a dry cell and padded and kind of felt like a shoe box as it was five and a half foot wide, end quote. Aww. Well, chicken shit, this is where they send sneaky people who appeared to be harmless and friendly in everyday life when in fact they were treacherous. But this is where people like you are sent to think about what they have done. 
So sit there and think about what you have done. This place he was in, it was just him and a deputy. Some of the deputies talked to him, and others ignored him. One even asked to pray for him. After their prayer session, Chris took over and read Psalm 33:13 through 22. He wanted to read it at his sentencing, but thought it was probably better if he didn't. Chris and Shit relates every pod he was in to a stage in his life, but God has taken absolute control of him and is keeping him on the street path that leads to life everlasting. Chris says his mother asked him if Scribble could use the letters he wrote to his children in Shanann back in December. HLN wanted to use them in their documentary, but Chris and Ship believes God didn't want that but wanted Scribble's book be the platform instead. What a wise and informed choice Chris Sibble made collectively. I believe fate determined by a supernatural power brought these two together. Then he says that Scribble asks for some details into his life with Shanann and the girls, and he gives a detailed account of how life revolved around Bella and Cece and lists an entire typical day from A to Z, starting from school pickup in the afternoon, to the ride home, dinner, shower, before bed routines, etc. He said they worked as a team and pretty much forgot about focusing on one another because of that. He describes one of his favorite memories was of, obviously, the wedding. I'll never forget her walking down the aisle looking flawless and seeing her look into my eyes when she walked up to me saying, breathe. She literally took my breath away. That love never died, yet the focus of that love went toward the kids. End quote. She took your breath away. What a wretched and cruel and ironic thing to say, you dumbass pinhead. I have to stop with this letter and say this. Is he now blaming the kids for what happened? I guess it's their turn. He's blamed both Shanann and Nikki. When will he ever blame himself? Never? Oh yes, I forgot. Dark and evil forces and spirits, too. I nearly forgot about them. On with the letter. Quote, I can say with a certainty that I always loved Shanann and always will, but there was always that lingering fear that I would do something wrong. End quote. He does say he never communicated that to her, and compares himself to the frog that allows itself to get boiled in a pot of water because the warming water goes unnoticed. From what I am understanding, he is saying the torment of his personality trait of being nervous and submissive and walking on eggshells around Shanann seems to be at the root of what happened to him, as has been said several times in this book. Quote, there was uneasiness and careful, fearful planning with every step I took. That is not what love should feel like, but I never communicated that to her. When I was with Bella and Celeste, being a dad, there was no fear, just overwhelming love, end quote. So what happened to this overwhelming love? Quote, I didn't see what was happening until it was too late, and that mistake cost me the chance to grow old with my family for the rest of my physical life, end quote. For crying out loud, this letter needed to have been followed up on with a thousand and one more questions, Scribble, and then another updated letter to Scribbles from Chris and Shit. He thanks her for sending two songs. He says she asked him if there was anything about Nikki that he had not told her previously. He says she had a small group of friends that she didn't tell him about until the very end. She had been in an abusive relationship a few years earlier, after which she removed most of her social media. CW says she took some medications, but he is not sure for what. Then he tells the whole story of July 4th, going home because Shanann kept calling him that morning, and he had spent the previous night with Nikki. That she, Nikki, came to the house twice, once on July 4th and then again July 14th. So this letter comprises pretty much word for word what I've called the Dieter chapter. Go back to video featuring chapter 6. Part 7, The Mistress for that. Chris and Shit says, quote, Obviously, Nikki was insisting that I make more time with her no matter what, end quote. He then says on the first night in North Carolina, he gave Shanann 80 milligrams of oxycodone because he thought it would cause a miscarriage, as that's what he learned from the internet. 
He said Nikki, quote, didn't want me to spend time with my family or try to make things better with Shanann because she had nothing at all good to say about my family life, end quote. He said it twisted his head and he felt like a programmed robot. Oh, so now we're back to it being Nikki's fault. He said any hope of repairing his marriage was over when she gave him a key to her place when he returned from North Carolina. He declares he, quote, thinks this is the day he realized he had to do something. By do something, I assume he means annihilate his family. He claims that when they went on their Saturday night, August 11th date, that they talked about future plans and that once he had his own apartment, they could slow down the relationship and treat it as a quote-unquote normal relationship. What the hell does that mean? And why would you slow it down when you're finally legitimately free to see someone? He said he could tell she was making plans for the future, but he didn't know why because he had a beautiful wife and kids at home. Oh, brother, are you serious? Then he says the only thing Nikki had to offer him that he wasn't already getting at home was that he could be himself, but said it is not a reason to get rid of his family. He said, quote, Shanann did not do anything for me to get rid of her, end quote. Of course she didn't, but you intermittently lay the blame on everyone around you but yourself, all the while claiming you now accept responsibility. I call bullshit. No, Person Shed is just talking in circles here and contradicting himself. Quote, I never saw my marriage as a struggle until I met Nikki, end quote. He says he and Shanann had communication issues, that he would shut down and not participate in arguments. Shanann worried a lot about money. Quote, I guess you could say in the end we were more involved in a routine than a successful relationship because our days were so choreographed. I'm so glad the Lord delivered me from whatever evil was tormenting me and my family. I just wish they were still here. End quote. How self-serving can one be, Chris and Shet? So glad to hear that you've been liberated. You are a lying, cheating, asshat, wanker, chicken shit, imbecile, fuck face coward, pansy ass, contemptible piece of filthy excrement. About the canine dogs barking in the basement. Christen's shit says he went to get some trash bags. He said, quote, I know dogs can see and feel things humans can't. Maybe they felt the evil spirits that are in the house, end quote. I thought the evil spirits were inside you, Chris and Shed. So do they come with the house when it is finally sold? That really needs to be disclosed to potential buyers. And are they only in the basement? Chris says he spends much of his day reading and praying. Scribbles told us earlier that dinner is at 3.30 in a previous chapter. Chris says, quote, dinner is at 4 p.m. and then recreation is at 4.30 p.m. five days a week. Another standing count is at 5.30 p.m. with day room time from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Day room time is when we can all use the phone, watch TV, play cards or other games, and talk to each other, end quote. Chris prays for everyone he has met in prison because they may not have anyone praying for them on the outside. He also prays for everyone that writes to him, even the bad letters, quote, I also thank the Lord for all his blessings and for moving me to a safe place and for everything he is doing in my life, end quote. It would appear that everything is happening in a satisfactory way without any problems. I don't know about y'all, but that certainly brings comfort to me. He denies any CPS claims and said he's not in the loop of any court date. I'm not clear if he is talking about the HOA dues as far as a court date. Quote, there are so many things that don't make sense that people are grasping at that have no precedence in my eyes. But I have been very shielded from the logistics of my marriage, end quote. Who on earth is writing these letters for him? He is like, really man, expanded his vocabulary from like throwing like in several times in every sentence. Are we sure this is him? He calls Nicole Atkinson a concerned friend. He does not mention her by name, but it is obvious because she is mentioned as calling the police and news stations. So maybe Scribble took it out. These are just typed versions of the letters written to Scribble from Chris and Shit. 
no pictures or scans of them. But Kristen Schitt says, quote, I want to tell her I'm sorry for what I put you through, and thank you for being a faithful friend to Shanann, end quote. He says, quote, the YouTube presence I know nothing about, end quote. I don't know what this is in reference to. If Sherilyn had included her own blasted letters, some of this shit would make more sense. He calls October 1st, 2018, Forgiveness Night. He was in a room with a table, a TV, and a phone, sitting at the table and reading a book when the news came on around 9.30 p.m. This is when he heard his name on the television. He saw himself sitting in a courtroom in an orange jumpsuit in a picture of his family on the screen. Lockdown was a half an hour later, and he went into his cell and laid on his bunk in the dark. He started having memories flood his brain, happy memories of being a family. He laid in the dark and cried and asked God to take his pain away and to forgive him. He claims he felt a hand touch the top of his head, and he couldn't stop crying. He looked to the corner of the cell and saw his grandmother again. She opened her eyes and they were crimson red, and she motioned for him to come over to her. He said, quote, I cried until I thought my chest was going to come out. I physically could feel the pain. I knew the demon had come out of me, and I had been forgiven. That hand that touched me was God's hand, and he made the demon flee. Yes, I would love to be a free man, but no, I don't deserve to be. I want to pay my price for what I did to those who loved me, end quote. Something I found in this letter that was of the utmost importance was, quote, the more questions you ask, the more the gears in my brain start turning, end quote. Meaning, he was fine with your asking questions. In fact, he encouraged it. It made his fucking brain work. Remember, he claimed to have forgotten things? Questions made his brain start working. Scribbles, if you were going to write a book, why did you leave so much out? The important parts. She seems to be so out of touch. You might have included your flipping letters to him as well, so we understand all of the back and forth bullshit. Include all of his letters. Include all of the questions you ask him. It is so redundant to post letters that you've already covered in the book previously as a dramatic, embarrassing attempt of creative writing with tons of errors that was so out of touch with the topic at hand. It should have been one or the other. No need to do both. This chapter was very long and had the most information in it. Honestly, this one could have been broken up a bit. Between the letters that Chris wrote and the discovery, that is the entire book. What did Scribbles write? Nothing much from what I can tell. Chris talks more and more about his relationship with God. He comes across as if he's done a lot of soul searching, and there is no way to tell if it is sincere from a few letters. And he signs off every single letter as Chris, not Christopher. So I'm glad I'm almost done with my commitment to indicating the faults of this, this book. Only one more chapter and the epilogue. Don't worry, I will find something else to continually complain and make unkind remarks about. I've devoted a lot of time and effort into bitching, and I would even go as far as to say that I'm an expert. And that will be the end of this video. I will pick up with the final chapter, 28, in the next one. Much love and peace. Thank you for listening. Authorities aren't being specific, but the rumor around town is that Chris Watts is here in Waupon. This wouldn't be the first time a high-profile murderer was moved to the Dodge County Correctional Institution. This is the same prison Ed Gein, the man who inspired the movie Psycho, was held. Department of Corrections reports show Stephen Avery is behind bars here. People in town are used to having notorious criminals down the street. We don't want to be famous for that, but our, our economy kind of uh, relies on that. There's a link on the Wisconsin DOC website where you can send inmates money. We found 33-year-old Chris Watts listed. Radar Online is reporting Watts was transferred to this high-security prison in Waupon last week. That should be uh, stand as a, a star for our reputation. The Dodge County Correctional Institution tells us they're not able to confirm any information regarding the possible location of inmate Christopher Watts. Does that worry you at all, or are you just used to it? I'm just used to it. It's, it doesn't bother me at all. If they get out of here, where are they going to go? They're going to head out of here as quickly as they can.
The Colorado DOC spokesperson tells us Watts is no longer in Colorado. He says high-profile prisoners can move to other states for safety reasons. The Wisconsin DOC says in a statement it is not confirming the location or disclosing the identity of inmates who may have been transferred to Wisconsin. Those criminals have to be somewhere, so I guess we'll just be satisfied that they're here. We're told the victim's family was notified of the move. In Dodge County, Corinne South, today's TMJ4.